Hey everyone, Ryan here. Welcome to our practice questions video where you'll get to test everything that you've learned in the previous videos of the oral surgery series. So this is everything we talked about in our oral surgery series. And if you haven't already, I would definitely recommend watching that first and then coming back to this video. I broke down the material covered on the board exam into 10 videos of high yield information. And as you'll see, this information can really help you on the board exam. So I compiled several questions for us to go through together from old released questions, practice books, and questions that I modeled after actual exam questions when I took the test. So these are going to be very similar to what you'll see on test day. All right, so question number one, go ahead and pause the video, think through the question, and then we'll go over it together. All right, so question number one is, what is the nerve most damaged in TMJ surgery? So this one's a little bit tricky right off the bat because all the answer choices are nerves of the face, and three of them happen to be cranial nerves. The trigeminal, which is five, facial nerve is seven, glossopharyngeal is nine. Of course, you don't need to know all this information, I'm just filling you in on some of the details. The auriculotemporal nerve and inferior alveolar nerves are actually branches of V3, which is the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. So they're all essentially part of cranial nerves. Now we know from our TMJ anatomy that the TMJ is right in front of the ear. And so we might be able to rule out or rule in some of these answer choices early on. Auriculotemporal has auric in the name, which is pointing to the ear, and so we can assume that this is pretty close to the ear. Now the facial nerve also crosses right in front of the temporomandibular joint and branches through the parotid gland, which is also pretty close by. So if you didn't remember the high yield fact to answer this question, you could try to reason it out based on location and narrow it down potentially between B and D, and then you'd have a 50-50 shot. So it turns out, due to proximity, the facial nerve, especially the temporal and zygomatic branches of the facial nerve, are highly susceptible for damage during TMJ surgery. So the answer for this question is B. And you can see from this diagram the facial nerve passes right over, right close by the TMJ, and so it's going to be most vulnerable to damage from surgery. All right, question number two. Go ahead and pause the video, then we'll talk about this. Okay, so where is the maxillary third molar most likely to be displaced during an extraction? All right, so we could probably rule out one of these answer choices right away, and that being submandibular, because we're talking about a maxillary tooth, not a mandibular tooth. The submandibular space would be the correct answer if it were talking about a mandibular, a mandibular third molar. Now, maxillary first and second molars are most often displaced into the maxillary sinus, but not the third molar. So this is sort of a trap answer. Again, this is just a high yield fact that can appear on test day just as is. And the displacement of the maxillary third molar into the infratemporal fossa is usually associated with incorrect extraction technique, a disto angular impacted tooth, decreased visibility during surgery, or a lack of bone in the tuberosity region distal to the tooth, which would lead it to displace in that direction. So the answer to this question is D. Question number three. Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll go over this together. All right, so a patient has a skeletal deformity with a class three malocclusion. This deformity is the result of a maxillary deficiency. The ideal treatment is which of the following? So I mentioned this in our orthognathic surgery video. It's not enough just to know that it's skeletal class three, 
but we have to know what's causing the class three. Now, growth modification isn't an option here, so don't overthink it. The maxilla is at fault. It tells us there's a maxillary deficiency, so the ideal treatment will involve surgically moving the maxilla, specifically moving it forward. And so without overthinking it, the answer is simply B, surgical repositioning of the maxilla, and we didn't even have to know that we'd have to move it forward in order to correct for the maxillary deficiency. All right, question number four. Go ahead, pause the video, then we'll talk about this. All right, so this one's a bit longer than the other, so let's read through it carefully. Which of the following statements about the flap for the removal of a palatal torus is correct? So, we have a couple options here, all of them starting with the most optimal flap. This one is talking about a midline incision from the papilla, the incisive papilla, to the junction of the hard and soft palates. So that's a pretty big cut. You're going from between the two upper central incisors all the way back to the junction of the hard and soft palate. This one is a reflection of the entire hard palate back to a line between the two first molar teeth. That sounds really aggressive as a treatment option, but let's keep going. This one is talking about a mid-palatal incision that courses from the palatal aspect of tooth number three across to the palatal aspect of number tooth number 14. So that's a horizontal incision between the two molars. Okay, so that sounds somewhat reasonable. And the last one is shaped like a double Y with a midline incision and anterior and posterior sidearms extending bilaterally from the ends of the midline incision. All right, so that one doesn't sound too bad either. So even if you didn't remember, again, this is all about high yield facts. If you didn't remember that the double Y incision is for palatal torus removal, which is a giveaway for answer choice D, you might think through some of these options in the name of conservative treatment. And A and B, and even C a little bit, are, are very aggressive treatment methods. They're talking about, again, flapping the entire palate back, I mean, this, that's just pretty crazy for a palatal torus removal. So when in doubt, go with the more logical, conservative treatment option that's usually what they're going for on the board exam. So the answer for this question is going to be D. The double Y incision is used as a flap technique for palatal torus removal. All right, question number five. Go ahead, read through this question, and then we'll go over it together. All right, so this one in comparison is much, much shorter and very straightforward. So what is the most frequently impacted tooth? Now it is simple, but this can absolutely come up as a nice, easy question on the board exam. So impaction is a failure to erupt into the dental arch within the expected time. The primary reason for this is inadequate arch length. So it would make sense that a tooth that is the last to erupt into the arch may not be able to fit with all the other teeth there. So third molars are most frequently impacted. And this is a primary reason why they're extracted in many teenagers, teenagers and young adults, because they can pose periodontal problems, hygiene issues, especially if they're partially impacted. So the pattern to remember for impacted teeth is mandibular third molars, then maxillary third molars, then maxillary canines in that order. So the most frequently impacted tooth is going to be D, the mandibular third molar. All right, question number six. Now this one we didn't get a chance to talk about, but I think it's definitely important to go over now. So I'll just read this question and talk through it with you. So what is the best diagnostic tool for evaluating the temporomandibular joint? And we have five options, the MRI, which is magnetic resonance imaging, panoramic, periapical, CBCT, which is a cone beam image, and cephalometric. So, uh, and that's cone beam co computed tomography. So the best diagnostic tool for the TMJ is which of the following? Now, pan, cephs, 
and periapicals all have their place with evaluating teeth and bone, and they're used routinely in dentistry. But of those, the CBCT is actually the best image modality for hard tissue. It's just a lot more expensive, harder to come by, and has increased radiation. So it's used in selective cases. But the MRI is actually the best for soft tissue and the articular disc. So magnetic resonance imaging uses magnetic fields and radio frequencies rather than ionizing radiation used in x-rays and CT, which allows for direct visualization of the disc. And that's obviously what we care about if we're looking at the TMJ. So you can see soft tissues and especially the disc best with what's called a T1 weighted image of an MRI. And so the high yield factor, remember here, is simply an MRI is best when evaluating the TMJ. And so the answer here is A. And you can appreciate how you can see the disc better in this kind of image than you would in any of the four other ones. All right, question number seven. Go ahead and read through this question, and then we'll go over it together. All right, what is the luxator of choice for extraction of a single retained root of a mandibular molar? So my mantra with these test questions, and I'm sure I've said it multiple times, is to always start with what you know. Otherwise, you can get overwhelmed with what you don't know, and really, you probably already know all the information you need, so I think it's always helpful to just kind of re recapitulate what you know. So, let's start with what we know and recall the three main steps of an extraction. Number one, we sever the soft tissue attachment. Number two, we luxate the tooth with an elevator. And number three, we deliver the tooth with forceps. So, this question is concerning the second phase of the procedure, which will rule out the periosteal elevator. Even though it says elevator in the name, we know that the periosteal is for releasing the periosteum and severing the soft tissue attachment. Now we have four answer choices left. The root tip pick is certainly tempting, and I would call this a trap answer because, well, we're talking about a retained, a single retained root. So why wouldn't we use a root tip pick? But all of these elevators have something in common. They all function as wedges and levers, except for one of them. And that is the crier, which uses a special wheel and axle rotation, which is perfect to remove a broken root tip in a socket and is particularly good for single retained roots of mandibular molars because you can insert the triangular elevator into the socket of the root tip that was already removed and then essentially pierce the other root and with a wheel and axle rotation elevate and luxate it out of the socket. So for this particular example Again, this is just kind of recapitulating high yield facts. The crier elevator is going to be your luxator of choice. So the answer here is A. All right, question number eight. Go ahead and think through the problem and then we'll go over it together. So what is the minimum labiolingual dimension of bone required to place an implant diameter of 3.5 millimeters? So an implant has a diameter of 3.5 millimeters. Another thing this, uh, essentially what this question is asking is how much bone do we need on either side of that implant? So we had a list of a couple of numbers that I had highlighted in red font that are extremely important to memorize for the board exam. And so this one is the fact that we need one millimeter of buccal bone and one millimeter of lingual bone on either side of the implant to prevent unwanted side effects like fenestration and dehiscence. So if we add all that together, of course we need 3.5 millimeters for the diameter of the implant. We add one millimeter for buccal bone, add one millimeter for lingual bone, and so the absolute minimum dimension we would need 
labiolingually is 5.5 millimeters. So the answer is D. All right, question number nine. Go ahead and think through the question, then we'll talk about it together. Okay, which of the following is the most common post-operative problem associated with mandibular sagittal split osteotomies? So another name for this is the bisagittal split osteotomy, or the BSSO. And so the BSSO had a major, uh, I don't want to say concern, but a major post-operative complication. And so remember, the issue with this surgery is the proximity of the inferior alveolar nerve. And so we can imagine that some nerve damage, nerve injury, or neurosensory disturbance like paresthesia or loss of sensitivity is going to be the most common post-op problem. So the answer here is going to be E. And you can appreciate how close that cut can be to where the inferior alveolar nerve enters the mandible. All right, question number 10. Go ahead and read through the question, then we'll go over it together. So which of the following is the least likely congenitally missing tooth? And this is just another one of those high yield trends or patterns to memorize really, really well. And be careful of the wording here. This is talking about the least likely congenitally missing tooth, not the most likely. And so I uh, disclose the most likely congenitally missing teeth pattern in I think the first video of the series and the order was the third molars being the most miss, most likely missing tooth, then the maxillary laterals, then the mandibular second premolars. So you might notice that three of the answer choices are three of the most commonly missing teeth. And so that leaves the maxillary canine as not among the three most likely missing teeth. So of the answer choices here, that has to be the correct answer. So the answer here is B. All right, question number 11. We're almost there. Go ahead, read through the question, then we'll go over it together. All right, so for surgical extraction of tooth number 30, which direction do you section the tooth to facilitate removal of the roots? So, the first one that's going to stick out to me is peripheral, peripherally, because that doesn't seem like the other ones. And it doesn't really make sense because that would be a different surgical extraction approach. Remember, we talked about digging a trough in buccal bone or interceptal bone, in a radicular bone around the tooth in order to uh, have easier access for elevation. But we're talking about sectioning the tooth here. So that one doesn't really make sense. Tooth number 30 most of the time has two roots, a mesial root and a distal root. So in order to section the tooth, remember we need to cut the tooth so it essentially becomes separate teeth with each with their own root. So if we have two roots, we need to make one cut to essentially convert this molar into two premolars. So in order to do that, we would cut right through to the bifurcation and section it buccolingually. And so we would have a mesial root and a distal root and then elevate out the two separate sections. So the answer here is going to be B. All right, question number 12. Go ahead and read through the question, then we'll talk about it together. Okay, which of the following is considered the highest and most severe classification of maxillary fracture? So you can probably guess that as you go down the line, we're getting more and more severe. That's usually how dental categorization works. But the trick here is how many types of Lefort fractures there actually are. So Leforts are mid-face fractures. Lefort 1 is horizontal across the maxilla bone. Lefort 2 is a pyramidal shape involving the orbits and Lefort 3 is complete craniofacial disjunction. 
and there is no Lefort 4, so that's a trick answer. So don't overthink it, you know everything you need to know for this question, and the answer is going to be C. Okay, question number 13. Go ahead, pause the video, read through the question, then we'll go over it together. Okay, myofacial or myofascial pain dysfunction is best described as which of the following? So we talked about myofascial pain dysfunction at the end of our TMD video. And so I described it as a chronic muscular pain disorder and the most common cause of masticatory pain. So if you just remember that, then one of these answer choices may stick out from all the rest. But we can rule out C pretty easily because we're not talking about any abscesses here or any itises here, no gingivitis or periodontitis, no kind of infection. There may be some inflammation associated with this disorder or dysfunction, but no infection. So we can rule out C pretty early on. Dislocation of the disc, uh, otherwise known as internal derangement of the articular disc, and clicking and popping, which is associated with disc displacement, specifically disc displacement with reduction, where it clicks as the condyle pops back over the anterior displaced disc, those all sound relatively relevant to the question. And while B and D can be symptoms of someone struggling with myofascial pain syndrome, the symptoms that best describe it are in A, and that's pain associated with the muscles of mastication and the subsequent limited function of those muscles, which best describes this chronic muscular pain disorder. And so the answer here is going to be A. All right, so now we're at question number 14. So the first day of the board exam will be 400 questions with oral surgery questions, just like the ones we just talked about, are sprinkled throughout those 400. Now on the second day, you'll get 100 more questions that are case-based. So they'll give you information on a patient with some clinical photographs and x-rays, and otherwise, the questions are very, very similar to the ones we just went over. So question number 14 and 15 will be examples of the cases pertaining to the same patient. So if you'd like, you can pause the video and think through this question, and then we'll go over it together. So you're performing a five-year follow-up on a 43-year-old patient with an implant. When comparing radiographs, you estimate that there has been almost 0.1 millimeters loss of bone height around the implant since it was placed. Which of the following is indicated? So we can think through the four measures of implant success, those being immobile, no peri-implant radiolucency, peri-implant bone loss of less than 0.2 millimeters per year after the first year, and absence of symptoms like pain. So I'm going to zoom in, zone into this number 0.1 millimeter loss of bone height. Now, a lot of these answer choices except for D are talking about removing the implant, replacing it with another implant, removing it, letting the area heal, making a crown because there are some odd forces on the implant possibly causing this bone loss. But if we go back to our four measures of implant success, as long as that peri-implant bone loss is less than 0.2 millimeters per year after the first year, that's okay. That is a sign of clinical health of the implant. And because 0.1 millimeters is less than 0.2, this is actually an indication of a successful implant placement. And not to mention, this is a five-year follow-up, so we can even expect up to a millimeter of bone loss or more and it still be a successful implant. And that's because some amount of bone loss is to be expected. This is not a natural tooth. Although we're getting a bit more stimulation of the bone than we would if nothing were there, it's still not the same 
And so a certain amount of bone loss is to be expected following implant placement. So we actually wouldn't do anything in this case, the implant's healthy, and this amount of bone loss is considered acceptable. So the answer here is D. And our last question, it's associated with the same patient. So you can go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this together. All right, so this same patient is undergoing a simple extraction and discloses that he has a needle anxiety. Oh boy. Shortly after the local anesthetic injection, the patient experiences an episode of vasovagal syncope. And of course, I should be asking here, what would you, what, which of the following should you not do? And I apologize for not including that in the question, but which of the following would you not do for this patient? So vasovagal syncope is stress-related fainting mediated by the vagus nerve, and it's often related to needle anxiety with, pe with people who are really afraid of getting that injection. So it's important that you lean the chair fairly far back and you tell them to keep breathing during the injection, but syncope can happen as it's the most common medical emergency in the dental clinic. So remember my acronyms. SPORT stands for stop treatment, position the patient, and let's just look at the one answer choice that says to place the patient in the Trendelenburg position. That's where their head is lower than their heart, lower than their legs. And so that is definitely something that we want to be doing to treat vasovagal syncope. So that is not the correct answer because as I should have asked here, we're looking for something that we would not do for this patient. So we can rule out B. So we'll go back to our acronym. We have, let me just draw this out, or write this out rather. So we said we stop treatment, we position the patient, specifically in Trendelenburg. O stands for oxygen. So we want to administer oxygen to this patient. Again, it's important that they're breathing, so we can rule out we can rule out B from positioning. We can rule out A, we want to administer oxygen. And we can rule out E, maintain airflow. Of course, that's sort of second nature, but it makes sense that we want to be allowing and enabling the patient to breathe properly. R stands for reassure the patient. And what do you know? That's one of the answer choices, so we can rule that out. And T stands for take vitals which is not an answer choice, but that would be reasonable to do for the patient. So that leaves us with D, administer epinephrine, and that is the correct answer. So epinephrine would be for anaphylactic shock with uh, administered with an EpiPen, so that's not relevant in this case. The other thing you can do for a patient who faints is using smelling salts or spirits of ammonia they release ammonia gas to basically it irritates the membranes of the respiratory system and it triggers an inhalation response, which allows the patient to wake up abruptly and arouse consciousness. So that's another thing that you can do and an easy thing to administer if this happens in the dental chair. All right, so that's it for this video. Those were 15 questions modeled after actual exam questions. I hope you did well, and I hope you feel confident after learning everything that we went over in our oral surgery series. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out my Patreon page. I've been blown away by the amount of support I've gotten over there. A huge thank you to Michael Raja, Ainz Lau, and David Jaden, and all of my patrons for all their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides so you can take notes on and study from them. And I ask even more practice questions exclusive to the Patreon page. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video series.